Glory to Jesus Christ. The season of Great Lent is now underway, and in today's Cloud of Witnesses, we're going to focus on the lives and the missions of three saints who are inextricably linked to the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. St. Mary of Egypt, St. Helena, and St. Mary Magdalene. Of the three saints, St. Mary of Egypt is held up as the model of repentance in the Eastern churches. Her life of penance and asceticism in the desert lasted 47 years, so it is fitting that she would be given the title model of repentance. For the duration of the great fast, her shadow will hover over the church, and from time to time, St. Mary of Egypt will come to the forefront. She shows us how even the most profligate of sinners can soften her heart repent, be reconciled to God, and attain theosis. The Lenten season is often referred to as bright sadness. In this bright sadness, the church creates an atmosphere that is conducive to softening our hearts and bringing us closer to God through repentance. And this atmosphere is especially felt in the pre-sanctified liturgy in its solemnity, its penitential prayers, its prostrations, all of those things which were found in the life of St. Mary of Egypt during her long years in the desert. The Lenten season is not static. We have a sense that this is all going somewhere as we realize a mysterious transformation is taking place within us as we move through the fast heading towards the celebration of the feast of Pascha. And as we increase our spiritual practices during this season, we may grow weary and become tempted to give up the struggle over so long a duration. The church understands human nature. And so on the third Sunday of the great fast, right in the middle of Lent, we pause to venerate the cross in order to refresh us and to encourage us to persevere because in a very short time, the light of the resurrection is going to break forth. And so this passage from Hebrews is most appropriate to us as an encouragement um, to persevere during the fast. Let us lay aside every burden and sin that clings to us and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in order that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet, that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed. In order to help us to stay on the path and persevere during this long duration of the great fast in our spiritual practices, our Byzantine Catholic faith has given us three Lenten helpers. The first one is St. Ephraim the Syrian, whose prayer with prostrations we recite at every pre-sanctified liturgy. This prayer saturates our mind and our spirit, and it helps us to maintain a penitential attitude before God. And we're all familiar with this prayer in the Byzantine tradition. It begins, O Lord and Master of my life, keep from me the spirit of indifference, lust of power and idle chatter, and so on. The second Lenten helper that the church gives us during this uh, Lenten season is St. John of the Ladder. Uh, he's also known as St. John Climacus. He has given us one of the greatest works on the spiritual life. It's called the Ladder of Divine Ascent. And although it was written for monastics, we can derive some spiritual benefit from it because during the fast, we are all called to live a little bit more of a monastic life. There is a very helpful companion guide uh, to the Ladder of Divine Ascent, and it's called 30 Steps to Heaven, the Ladder of Divine Ascent for All Walks of Life. So important uh, during the Lenten season is St. John of the Ladder, that he is commemorated on the fourth Sunday of the Great Fast. 
And the third Lenten helper the church gives us is St. Andrew of Crete. He wrote a very lengthy and profound writing called The Great Canon of St. Andrew of Crete, which is served during the fourth week of the Great Fast. And this very lengthy canon of St. Andrew of Crete offers us images of repentance from our forefathers and mothers, and it retells the entire story of the life of St. Mary of Egypt. Now, before we get into our saints uh, for today, I want to talk just a little bit about penance since we find ourselves in this most penitential uh, season of the year. Penance is the fundamental prerequisite of reestablishing our relationship with God when we sin after baptism. Penance is the fundamental prerequisite of reestablishing our relationship with God when we sin after baptism. Because of this, there is an expression that only the penitent can preach, either by words or by witness. Why? Because a penitential person is an authentic witness of life in Jesus Christ. And an authentic witness precedes and confirms the authenticity of the preacher or the teacher or the witness. Why is that? Because the penitent is in right relationship with God. The penitent knows who he is and who God is. And the penitent will say over and over and over, I am a sinner and you are the savior. And from this foundation, our entire spiritual life and our relationship with God unfolds. Now we might ask, well, isn't baptism the foundational prerequisite of entering into a relationship with God? Yes, but what happens when we sin after baptism? We separate ourselves from God and we must turn back again. There is water and there are tears, the water of baptism and the tears of repentance. There is one baptism, but there are many sins and many tears after baptism. And so our faith provides a way to be reconciled with God throughout our lives as much as is needed. Sometimes we fall easy, sometimes we fall hard. But either way, God invites us to turn back to him and renew our relationship with him once more. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How do we draw near to God so that he will draw near to us? We come to him with a pure heart asking for mercy. This is the one prayer that God always answers, the prayer of the penitent asking for mercy. God did his part of reconciling sinners back to himself when he sent his son to die on the cross. But now we must do our part to affect that reconciliation by approaching him with a repentant heart and receiving his mercy and forgiveness. In the spiritual life, this is referred to as synergy or synergia, which is God and man working together. God gives the grace and we respond. This is where the efficaciousness of the Jesus prayer comes into play because the Jesus prayer puts us in right relationship with God. It expresses the truth of who I am, a sinner, and who God is, the Savior. Recognition of oneself as a sinner is not a morbid or a morose condemnation of the human person. All heartfelt penance is a yearning to be reconciled with God, and it is therefore a joyful sorrow. Our Eastern Catholic Catechism, Light for Life, refers to this joyful sorrow as a double insight. This double insight was given to the prodigal son. When he came to the end of himself 
and made the willful decision to return to his father and his father's house, on the one hand, he was filled with remorse for his sins, but on the other hand, he had the assurance that he could return to his father's house. This is a profound mystery. The Holy Spirit gives the grace to repent and at the same time gives the assurance of being forgiven and restored to communion with the Father. Now, in the parable of the prodigal son, the older son claimed to do everything right. But what he lacked was a penitent's heart. We know that he uh, saw himself as doing everything right because he mentions all of the things that he did right. He said, I have served you all these years. I never disobeyed your orders. I was the good and faithful son. But because he lacked a penitent's heart, he didn't have the sobriety to realize the truth of who he really is, a sinner in need of a savior. Now, penance and mercy alone are not what we will be judged by. Ultimately, we will be judged by how much we loved and served those in need. But that's another topic for another time. Today, I wanted to just say a few things uh, focusing on penance. Okay, so let's get into our saints uh, of today, St. Mary of Egypt, St. Helena, and St. Mary Magdalene. So we begin today's presentation, uh, this part of the presentation on this cloud of witnesses, the saints, where we always begin by looking at their icon. The saints during their earthly life are filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit. After their departure, the same grace remains in their souls. And that same grace is present and active in their sacred images and their icons. So to summarize that, the saints are made present in their icons. That's why when we walk into the temple, we can look around and we can say we are literally surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses because all of these icons make present the saints or the mother of God or our Lord who they uh, depict. Remember when we look at an icon uh, of, of the saints, for example, it's not so much we look at them, but they look at us. And the icons teach us something. They tell us something. In this icon uh, on the far left is St. Helena, one of the saints we're looking at today. And what this icon tells us or shows us is that she uh, was an empress because she is dressed in royal robes, uh, garments, and she's wearing a crown. But she also is always depicted with a cross. And mo many times it's a life-size cross because she is the saint who found the true cross and the relics of the crucifixion. This icon is St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary of Egypt. We know that this is St. Mary Magdalene because in addition to holding an ointment jar, she's holding a red egg, which is another one of her symbols that she is often depicted with in iconography. And we know that this is St. Mary of Egypt because she is depicted exactly as we are told she looked in the life of St. Mary of Egypt. Uh, she is wearing the ragged clothes of a desert ascetic. She has the... Uh, emaciated body of a desert ascetic, and she has shoulder-length white hair, which was as white as fleece, which is how she is described in the official life of St. Mary of Egypt. Now, we don't know who painted this icon, but perhaps they painted this icon because they wanted to show side by side two models of repentance. That might be the first impression we get when we see them depicted together. And they are depicted in this icon like bookends, side by side. Although we think that they are probably or maybe linked together because they are both models of repentance, we're going to see that the actual link between these two uh, saints is St. Saint Helena. And we're also going to see um, 
a different portrayal of St. Mary Magdalene throughout the centuries. And so we're going to um, recognize in this icon where they're depicted as icons that there's maybe a different connection to them being side by side than just what we might think that they are both models of repentance. So we begin with these three saints with St. Mary Magdalene because she comes first in chronological time. She is considered the most significant female figure in the church after the mother of God. She is named 12 times in the Gospels. No other woman in the New Testament is named as much as St. Mary Magdalene. She has two titles uh, in the Eastern Church, the Eastern Church classification of saints, equal to the apostles and apostle to the apostles. So we're going to begin with St. Mary Magdalene by unraveling the admixture of what we know and what we do not know about her as found in the Gospels. Three Gospel accounts of Jesus being anointed with oil are mentioned um, during his time of ministry, not uh, after his death. But in the Gospel accounts, there are three anointings of Jesus. Mary Magdalene is not named as the woman in any of these three anointings. The first anointing, and these are not in, in order, but the first one, a woman with an alabaster jar breaks the jar open and she pours the perfume over his head. The woman is unnamed. It doesn't identify her as Mary Magdalene. In the second anointing, the woman is identified as Mary of Bethany. She's the sister of Martha and Lazarus. She is the one who anointed his feet and dried them with uh, her hair. That was not Mary Magdalene, it was Mary of Bethany. In the third anointing of Jesus, there is a sinful woman at the Pharisee's house, and she stood behind Jesus weeping. She bathed his feet with her tears, she dried them with her hair, and then she anointed his feet with oil. It does not mention that it was Mary Magdalene. Aside from the anointings, Mary Magdalene is often thought of as the woman caught in adultery. We're all familiar with that passage where the men picked up stones to stone the woman who was caught in adultery. Jesus intervenes and says, who uh, condemns you? She says, no one. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There is no name mentioned of that woman caught in adultery. She is not identified as Mary Magdalene. What we do know um, about um, Mary Magdalene in the Gospels, where she is specifically mentioned, is that Jesus delivered her of seven demons which consumed her. Accompanying him were the twelve and some women who had been cured of evil spirits. Mary, called Magdalene, whom seven demons had gone out. We don't know the exact nature of these demons, but some of the church fathers have interpreted them as the opposite of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned in Isaiah 11. We do know that she repented of whatever sins may have been attached to this demonic influence because it resulted in a radical change in her life and she became one of the closest most sensitive and most ardent followers of Jesus and his mission. So how did she come to be known as the repentant prostitute? This is where a major divergence occurred in history between the Eastern and the Western portrayals of her. In the West, starting from about the sixth century onward, her life story became conflated with the woman caught in adultery the woman who shed tears uh, on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair, and the persona of a repentant prostitute. Because the gospel references her um, as being delivered of seven demons, it was thought or possibly assumed that these demons must have been demons of lust. And so in the ensuing centuries, Western art solidified this interpretation of her as it moved from iconography 
as the normative religious artistic expression to the subjective expression of the faith around the 12th century. And all of these confluences together resulted in a long entrenched history of portraying Mary Magdalene as the repentant prostitute, but the Eastern tradition has never accepted her as a prostitute, rather it looks to the gospels uh, for its portrayal of her person. So the West considers St. Mary Magdalene as the model of repentance, but the East considers St. Mary of Egypt the model of repentance. And this is why we don't really see icons depicting St. Mary Magdalene as a penitent. She is never identified in the Gospels in relation to a male. Now, what we do know about St. Mary Magdalene with certainty is that whenever she is mentioned by name in the Gospels, it is within the context of the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. In icons, she is depicted within these events. She is present at the crucifixion, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. She is present when Jesus was taken down from the cross. She is present at his burial in the tomb. The women followed behind Joseph of Arimathea and the body of Jesus, and when they had seen the tomb and the way his body was laid in it, they returned and prepared spices and oils. She is the one in the Gospels to whom Jesus first appeared after his resurrection. When he had risen on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She is the one given the command to go and tell the disciples that he is risen. Do not hold on to me. Go to my brothers and tell them I am going to my father. Jesus' mission did not end in the crucifixion and the resurrection. He had to ascend to the Father in order to send the Holy Spirit so that we could become children of God. We also know about Mary Magdalene that she was part of a group of women who, along with the 12 disciples, accompanied Jesus as he went from town to town preaching. The Gospel of Luke specifically mentions Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others who provided for his ministry out of their resources and were also present at the crucifixion and the burial. These women are known as the myrrh-bearing women. And because of Mary Magdalene's presence and compassionate fortitude during our Lord's Passion, she is recognized as the head of this group of holy myrrh bearers. There are seven myrrh bearing women. Mary Magdalene, and her name heads every list of the women disciples. Mary of Clopas, Martha, Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, Salome, Joanna, and Susanna. All of those myrrh-bearing women are commemorated on the second Sunday after Pascha, which is referred to as the Sunday of the Holy Myrrh-Bearers. Now, in addition to these seven women who are called the Holy Myrrh-Bearers, there are two other myrrh-bearers, and they are men. And they are also commemorated on the second Sunday after Pascha, on the same day that we commemorate the Holy Myrrh-Bearing Women. These other myrrh bearers are St. Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, or the Supreme Council of Jews. He is described as a secret disciple of Christ. However, when Jesus was crucified, he was unmindful of the danger of being associated with him, and he boldly asked Pilate, for permission to take the body of our Lord down from the cross. And being a wealthy man, he provided the tomb in which Jesus was buried. The other myrrh bearer, or Mirafor, 
um, who is commemorated with myrrh-bearing women, who is a male, is Nicodemus. And he is referred to as the disciple by night. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds, and he and Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus down from the cross. They bound it with burial cloths and anointed it with spices according to the Jewish custom. On Good Friday, we have a beautiful tradition here uh, in our Byzantine uh, church where we reenact the crucifixion and the death of our Lord. And during the service on Good Friday, we process around the church with the priest bearing the burial shroud or the plashanitsia of Jesus. And we sing a hymn commemorating Joseph of Arimathea's movements at the cross and the tomb. The noble Joseph took down from the cross your most pure body. He wrapped it in linen, anointing it with spices, and placed it in a new tomb. And so St. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, along with the myrrh-bearing women, are inextricably linked during the time of the Passion to the cross and the tomb of Jesus. The Church Fathers see a correlation between St. Mary Magdalene and Eve. The Garden of Paradise was a garden of life, but it brought death into the world. The tomb, meant to hold death, instead becomes a garden of life. Eve fell into sin after talking to the evil spirit in the garden and brought the message to Adam, which resulted in the fall of mankind. And because of Eve's action, female nature became fallen. Mary Magdalene spoke with an angel in the garden of life, and then brought the message of the resurrection to the apostles. Because a woman offered death to a man in paradise, a woman announces life to the men from the tomb. It's taken from an ancient homily. Just as Adam was not seen when he was created except by Eve, Jesus, the new Adam, was not seen by anyone when he resurrected. But after his resurrection, a woman was again the first to see him. And so in this uh, interpretation and this understanding of the church fathers, the responsibility of the woman for the sin of Adam was abolished when God chose Mary Magdalene as the first witness to the resurrection. And the result is the restoration of female nature because in the resurrection, Christ makes all things new. Why is she depicted with a red egg in iconography? After the resurrection of Christ, there is a tradition that Mary Magdalene went to a banquet in Rome and present at the banquet was the emperor Tiberius Caesar, and she was holding in her hand an egg. We don't know why, maybe they had to bring some type of a food item, but she was holding an egg in her hand, and she announced quite boldly to Caesar that Christ had risen from the dead. And Caesar mockingly said to her, and sarcastically said, a man can no more rise from the dead than that egg in your hand can turn red. God worked a miracle, the egg turned red, and so the red egg is a miraculous confirmation of the truth of the resurrection. So that's why we dye eggs red at Pascha and why her symbol in iconography is a red egg, in addition to the ointment jar. So St. Mary Magdalene is the first of the three saints inextricably linked to the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. She was literally there uh, and she played a very prominent role. Now, our second saint today is Saint Helena. She comes second in chronological time or historical time. 
And she too is inextricably linked to the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. St. Helena uh, was the mother of the Emperor Constantine, or we refer to him as St. Constantine the Great. She was an empress. She was a friend of the poor. She was a builder of churches. She is considered the first archaeologist, and she is considered the first long-distance pilgrim. She also is given the title equal to the apostles because of her great service to the church, because of her missionary efforts in finding the true cross, and her zeal to build churches throughout the Christian lands. So this title, equal to the apostles, which is shared by St. Mary Magdalene and St. Helena, is given to those saints whose mission is foundational, widespread, and permanent. St. Helena is the one chosen by God to unearth and find the true cross and the relics of the crucifixion. And through an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit, inspiring and guiding St. Helena, the place where the cross and the tomb had, lie, uh, had lay hidden for nearly 300 years would be found and made manifest for veneration once again. Helena was 77 years old when she set out to Jerusalem in search of the true cross. It's hard to imagine, um, especially back during that period in history, how difficult travel must have been, but a woman nearing 80 years old undertaking this kind of a mission is truly quite uh, extraordinary. The trip was funded by her son Constantine, the emperor who provided all the resources for her mission, the funds, the manpower, whatever was needed. And he also gave her a letter to give to the patriarch of Jerusalem, Macarius. In Jerusalem, the emperor Hadrian had systematically and intentionally wished to destroy all traces of Christianity so that people would forget about Christ. And he built a pagan temple to Venus over the site of Christ's crucifixion and over the tomb. In Bethlehem, that emperor, uh, at the site of Christ's birthplace, he set up an idol of Adonis. So St. Helena arrives in Jerusalem uh, to this scenario. And with the patriarch, when she uh, arrives, she ordered all the pagan temples built over the holy sites to be destroyed and re-consecrated. Uh, Taking as a sign from God where to dig, she happened upon a spot of, of dirt that had an unusual smelling herb growing out of the ground. And Helena named this unusual herb basil, which means kingly or royal. And this is why uh, a, base, a wreath of basil leaves is placed around the cross on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. In some churches, they scatter basil around, or we use basil in cooking, on, especially on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. It's a, um, a real strong symbolic connection to the fact that that was a sign to Helena of where to dig to try to find the true cross. And through the extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit inspiring and guiding her and the patriarch's prayers, the spot where that basil was growing is the spot where the cross was found. It was nearly 300 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And what St. Helena found on that spot was three crosses, four nails, and the sign that hung atop his head on the cross. The traditional date of the finding of the true cross is May 3rd, 326. St. Ephraim has, uh, has a little homily in which he gives a beautiful symbolic reflection on, this, on the, the true cross. He says, under the old covenant, the tree of life continued to remain hidden from humanity. And it was only with the crucifixion that it was finally made manifest. 
It sank down into the virgin ground and was hidden only to burst forth and reappear on Golgotha. But now, 300 years later, after having gone back into the earth and was hidden once again, it was unearthed from the soil and made manifest for the whole world to see. Now, St. Helena has a dilemma because she found three crosses. Which one is the cross of Christ? And so after seeing a dying woman nearby, the patriarch was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he prayed this prayer that the Holy Spirit would help them determine which of these three crosses was the true cross. And so the patriarch prayed like this. O Lord, who by, your passion, who by the passion of your only Son on the cross, deign to restore salvation to mankind, and who has inspired your handmaid Helena to seek for the blessed wood to which the author of our salvation was nailed, show clearly which it was among the three crosses that was raised for your glory. Distinguish it from those which only served for a common execution. Let this woman who is now expiring return from death's door as soon as she is touched by the wood of salvation. And the patriarch touched each of the three crosses to the dying woman. And after she was touched by the true cross, the woman came to life and the patriarch knew this in fact was the true cross that Christ was crucified on. Word spread like wildfire. Christians came in, thongs, uh, came in throngs to venerate the cross. And we can only imagine the joy of St. Helena. In the Akathis to St. Helena, we say, you filled the world with incomparable joy. Now here's a very interesting aside. In the Byzantine marriage ceremony, when uh, the priest is blessing the couple, he refers to St. Helena's joy when he asks God to bless the couple. And so the priest says, bless them as you blessed Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Joachim and Anna. And may that joy come upon this couple which blessed Helena had when she found the precious cross. That's in the Byzantine marriage ceremony. The joy of St. Helena when she found the true cross. So the result of her mission is that the church established the feast of the exaltation of the cross and the practice of venerating the true cross every year on that date. Now, the relics of the true cross and the crucifixion can be found all over the world. In addition, St. Helena had all the pagan temples that were covering the holy sites of Christianity destroyed and built churches over them, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And in all, she is credited with building somewhere around 365 churches. And so now we see in our second saint how St. Helena was inextricably linked to the actual literal cross and the tomb uh, of Jesus Christ. So we continue our presentation today on the three saints who are inextricably linked to the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. And we spoke about St. Mary Magdalene and St. Helena, and now we come to St. Mary of Egypt. She is placed before us as the model of repentance at the beginning of Great Lent, and she casts a very large shadow over the entire Lenten season. There are certain points during the Great Fast where she will come back to the forefront. In particular, the fourth week of, of Lent, or the Great Fast, when the great canon of St. Andrew of Crete is uh, served, as some of the churches do it, and her entire life story is read in uh, the context of the great canon of St. Andrew of Crete. And the fifth Sunday of Lent is um, referred to in our Byzantine 
uh, liturgical year as the Sunday of St. Mary of Egypt. Her feast day is April 1st. Uh, this year it will be Bright Monday. So her feast day will fall either within the Lenten season or, um, or, or beyond that, depending on how the calendar falls in any particular year. She is considered the model of repentance par excellence because she repented from a, public, a life of public debauchery and she remained faithful to Christ until the very end of her earthly life. We see in St. Mary of Egypt the fulfillment uh, or a fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy in the Old Testament. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you. You shall live in the land I gave your fathers. I will save you from all your impurities and I will be your God. St. Mary of Egypt's Lenten journey or bright sadness to use that that beautiful poetic term, took place in the desert and it lasted for 47 years. She shows us how to live in joyful sorrow. She, filled, um, her, um, she was filled with contrition for her many sins, yet she persevered in the hope of the resurrection. Her prayer in the desert can be summed up in this passage in the Eucharistic prayer of the Divine Liturgy. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The life of St. Mary of Egypt was written by St. Sophronius, the patriarch, and thank God he had the foresight to record this extraordinary life for posterity. The life of St. Mary of Egypt is available everywhere. You can find it on the internet, you can just copy it, um, or you can order it. It's, it's not a very um, lengthy work. Um, it's in booklet form, but I, I, it's one of the um, texts that I highly recommend during this Lenten season. Her life consists of two parts, the public sinner and the repentant woman who lived in the desert and attained theosis or divinization. So here's her story summarized. When she was 12 years old, she renounced her parents' loving care and she went to Alexandria, the capital of Egypt. And she lost her virginity and she gave herself up, in her words, unrestrainedly and insatiably to sensuality. And for 17 years, she lived like this. And she describes this time of her life this way. I was like a fire of public debauchery. I acted in this way to gain as many men as possible because it gave me pleasure. Sometimes she's referred to as a prostitute but she herself says she never took money for her relations. She was simply motivated to fulfill her own passions. So one day, she saw a large crowd of people running to the sea for a voyage. They were traveling to Jerusalem to venerate the true cross for the Feast of the Exaltation, which was established because of St. Helena's mission of finding the true cross. And so she decided to join this group of people that were going on a voyage. But she didn't have the money for the trip. And so she offered her body as a ticket, a ticket for the voyage. And all the way there, she continued her lustful behavior. And she says this, I am amazed how the sea stood our licentiousness how the earth did not open its jaws and how hell did not swallow me alive when I entangled so many men in my snares. But I think God was seeking my repentance for he does not desire the death of a sinner but magnanimously awaits his return. 
She thought she was going on a trip with a bunch of men who could make her happy, so to speak. But God, on the other hand, was seeking her repentance and already had a plan in place to bring it about should she cooperate with the grace that she was going to be given. So the pilgrims arrived in Jerusalem and entered the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where the true cross was uh, being um, elevated and venerated. And this is the church that was built by St. Helena. And St. Mary of Egypt was literally sinning all the way up to the door of the church. She says, as she approached the church, that she was still flying about hunting for youths. So she unknowingly finds herself at the door of the church. And she doesn't really know anything about what this is all about or where she is. And she doesn't really care at this point. The crowd that she found herself in was pushing and shoving to enter the church to venerate the true cross. Now this is where two things are going on at once. Human curiosity and grace. On the human level, solely out of curiosity, she desired to enter the church with everyone else just to see what all the excitement was about. Curiosity and nothing more. It was a crowd, it was the in thing going on at that place at that time. So she was curious to see what all this excitement was about. But deep within her and unbeknownst to her, something was happening on the spiritual level of grace that was bringing her to the cross. She said, when I trod on the doorstep, I was stopped by some force which prevented me from entering. She couldn't get in the church, no matter how hard she tried. And she assumed it's because she was small and weak and she couldn't push hard enough against the crowd. And she tried three or four times, she couldn't push her way into the entrance. She said, looking back, it was as if there was a detachment of soldiers standing there to oppose my entrance. And so exhausted and with no more strength to push, she went and stood in the corner of the patio. And in that moment, which was her fullness of time, the scales fell from her spiritual eyes. The fullness of time is a mystery to us. Why does something break through at that moment, why uh, was her fullness of time not a month earlier? Well, it wouldn't have been the, the feast for one thing, but um, why is the fullness of time in the exact moment that it is for any of us? Why wasn't it a year before when they had the exaltation of the cross? Why wasn't it the next year? Conversions happen in souls in the fullness of time. That is the mysterious intersection between grace and repentance. And when the two line up, an extraordinary force occurs within the soul that turns the person back to God no matter how far they have fallen. And it gives us hope when we pray for people and we are not seeing the fullness of time yet in their conversions. We have to leave that to God because God's ways are above our ways and there is a mystery at what point grace and repentance are going to line up and bring about conversion in the soul. So the scales now have fallen from her spiritual eyes as she's standing on the corner of the patio. And very slowly, she begins to realize that a mysterious transformation is taking place within her. And she says this, and only then with great difficulty, it began to dawn on me. And I began to understand the reason why I was prevented from seeing the life-giving cross. 
the word of salvation gently touched the eyes of my heart and revealed to me that it was my unclean life which barred the entrance to me. I began to weep and beat my breast and sigh from the depths of my heart. And as I stood weeping, I saw above me the icon of the mother of God. Before that icon, she makes a life-changing prayer of repentance and she vows to the mother of God she will never defile herself again with the impurity of fornication. That prayer of uh, St. Mary of Egypt's repentance can be found online. Um, for those of you uh, present here, uh, there's a handout, um, but I would refer you to look online under St. Mary of Egypt's prayer of repentance. It's a very beautiful prayer and it's very in-depth and it applies to all of us. So now St. Mary of Egypt was filled with the hope of a new life because she had confidence in the mercy of God. She experienced the same double insight as the prodigal son, at one and the same time realizing the depths that she had fallen into sin, but at the same time she was consoled that she was being given a way to come back to the Father. And only now, after the earth-shattering work of conversion occurred in her soul, was she able to walk into the church and then venerate the true cross. So she enters the church now with ease, and weeping, she venerates the true cross. As she leaves, she hears a voice telling her, if you cross the Jordan, you will find rest. Still weeping from her repentance, she went to the church of St. John the Baptist where she received the holy mysteries, the sacraments, and then she laid down on the ground and slept all night. This would be her last communion for 47 years, perhaps the longest communion fast in the history of our faith. The next morning she found a boat and she crossed the Jordan River and she went into the desert where she would live all alone, seeing no one, doing penance for 47 years. When she went into the desert, someone had given her a few coins and she brought a few loaves of bread she took the loaves of bread with her and they lasted, I think she, she was able to uh, have one of the loaves of bread last her about a year because she would just take a tiny uh, morsel to eat and sustain herself. And then after, of course, a certain time, the bread was gone and uh, she no longer had anything to eat. So what does a life look like when it's lived in the desert for 47 years? She tells us that the first 17 years were spent fighting mad desires and passions in the form of wild beasts. And the devil made war on her through her, the memories of her former life. It's interesting this lasted 17 years because that was the number of years that she was living in public debauchery from the age of 12 when she left home to the age of 29 when she repented uh, at the true cross. So it was the same number of years, it was a period of 17 years that she lived a life of sin, and then for the first 17 years in the desert, uh, she was fighting the, the passions and the desires and all of those demons of lust and so forth that uh, she had to overcome. She said during that time she desired different kinds of food and drink and she was tempted to remember immoral songs from her past. And she said when the temptation seemed unbearable, she would fling herself to the ground and implore the intercession of the mother of God who always came to her aid. When the violent storm of spiritual battle passed, a lasting calm descended on her and light would appear from every side. She lived in the harshest conditions of heat and cold 
and she ate next to nothing but a few herbs all the years that she lived in the desert. Her clothing was torn and worn out, and after a certain time um, of, of wearing these rags, she was then naked. Now she would be clothed in repentance instead of rags. She never wavered from her task of unceasing prayer and repentance, and she kept her vow to the mother of God all those years until the very end. And this is why the church regards her as the model of repentance. She surpassed not only female nature, but human nature. Which of us, any of us, male or female, could live such a life, let alone a female? She attained theosis, divinization. She became a partaker of the divine nature of God. She attained theosis rather than any kind of psychosis because after 47 years alone with no human interaction, it could cause some kind of mental imbalance. We would assume that it would, but because she was, um, uh, she was, uh, kept in grace all of that time, um, she attained theosis rather than any kind of a psychotic um, imbalance or difficulty. The desert was her tomb in which her old self died, but then it became her place, the place of her resurrection because she was purified of her passions and her sins and she became a partaker of the divine nature of God. She died on the night that she received her first communion after 47 years in the desert, which was brought to her by a wandering monk who um, they had a practice, uh, a monastic practice at the time in his monastery. Uh, his name was the monk Zosimus. He was a priest monk. And uh, in their monastery, they had the practice every Lent of going out into the desert alone and not speaking to anyone else, but spending the whole time in the desert um, in order to intensify their prayer and asceticism. And this wandering monk, Zazimus, is the one who found her, and it is to him that she gave her life story. But she said, come back next year and bring me communion. And so he came back that next year and he brought her communion, the first communion she um, received in 47 years. And this is why you will very often see in iconography the priest Zosimus giving communion uh, to Mary of Egypt in the desert. So he gives her her first communion 47 years, and he says, I'll come back next year once again when uh, we have our Lenten practice of going out into the desert, I will visit you again. He comes back the next year and he finds her dead. And she uh, left some writing in the sand, and apparently she was illiterate, couldn't read or write, and she left a writing. She said, here, Mar uh, bury the body of Mary. He didn't even know her name, but now he knew her name. And I guess she was able to indicate somehow in the sand um, that she died on that night that he gave her communion a year ago. And so now he has the responsibility to bury her body and he tries to dig and he doesn't have, of course, a shovel or anything. He can't, um, he can't dig up the ground and a lion appears and scares him, uh, understandably, because she says she never saw any wild beasts in the desert and so a lion appears, and the lion was very gentle, and the lion was licking her feet, and uh, Zosimus made the sign of the cross, and he asked the lion if he would dig the grave so that they could bury the body of Mary, and the lion helped her dig the grave, and that's why the lion is another very important symbol in her iconography. In fact, we have a, an icon of St. Mary of Egypt here, and I believe the lion is depicted on it as well. So all three saints now made a pilgrimage to the true cross and to the tomb and bear witness to the resurrected life in Christ. St. Mary Magdalene, St. Helena, and St. Mary of Egypt. Chronologically speaking, St. Mary Magdalene comes first 
in her pilgrimage because it occurred in real time. She will forever be linked to the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. Uh, and, uh, and she is an actual witness, um, was an actual witness of his passion, his death, and his burial. And she has the honor of being chosen as the first witness of the resurrection. And then for nearly 300 years, the cross and the tomb were hidden. And the cross literally went underground. The tomb was covered over by a pagan shrine until St. Helena made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and uncovered the cross and the tomb. And so she is linked to St. Mary Magdalene because she continues St. Mary Magdalene's mission of being present at the true cross and the tomb and uh, proclaiming their glory now for all the world to see. And because of St. Helena's mission, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross was established, which drew pilgrims from all over to venerate the Tree of Life. And so the final link in this trio of saints is St. Mary of Egypt, because her dramatic and life-changing conversion took place in the church of the Holy Sepulchre built by St. Helena over the cross and the tomb. And it took place as she venerated the cross uh, in the place of the tomb. And so St. Mary of Egypt finishes this trio of the three saints who are inextricably linked to the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. St. Helena's mission bore its most famous fruit, if we could speak about it that way, in St. Mary of Egypt's conversion, who repented in the very place that St. Helena, um, where she discovered the cross and where she had built the um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. All three of these saints are represented in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There is an altar of St. Mary Magdalene, there is a chapel of St. Helena and a chapel of St. Mary of Egypt. So in the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned this theme of bookends between St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary of Egypt. And I mentioned that possibly um, the iconographer depicted them this way uh, in order to depict them both as models of repentance. But in this presentation, I took that in a little bit of a different direction, and uh, I see the bookends are that <clears throat> St. Mary of Egypt is with us as we begin the Great Fast, and she journeys with us all throughout the Great Fast. And um, St. Mary Magdalene is the one that we meet in the resurrection. So from the fast to the feast, um, St. Mary of Egypt and St. Mary Magdalene are like bookends, and it's St. Helena's mission in between the two that connects these two saints together uh, in liturgical time, although St. Helena is um, commemorated in a different, at a different time during the liturgical year, but that's how um, the three saints uh, are connected together in the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. I'm going to speak a little bit about the cross that was prefigured in the Old Testament, and then we're going to talk about the Byzantine iconographic theology of the crucifix so that we understand the difference between the Western depiction of a crucifix and the Byzantine depiction of a crucifix. The cross of Christ was prefigured or foreshadowed in the Old Testament. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible begins and ends with the tree of life. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and all of salvation history is focused on the saving work of the cross. And so it makes sense in salvation history that it begins in creation where the tree of the cross is mentioned it, right in the beginning of Genesis, and it makes sense that it is the last thing that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. The tree of life is mentioned in the Old Testament as the prototype of the cross. A tree of old cast me out of paradise, 
but now a tree leads me into paradise. What's interesting to note is that when St. Mary of Egypt made her prayer of repentance, she referred to the cross as the tree of life. In Genesis, we read that God planted many trees. They were delightful to look at and good for food. Two trees are particularly mentioned. One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other was a tree planted in the middle of the garden called the tree of life. This one was the prototype of the cross. Eating the fruit of the tree of life would have protected man's body from corruption and given him physical immortality. But through disobedience, Adam chose to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil instead. Humanity then could not partake of the tree of life until the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus. St. John of Damascus says, as the fall and death came about through a tree, so it was fitting that through a tree, life and resurrection should be given. For thousands of years, the tree of life was carefully guarded and paradise was closed until the crucifixion, which opened paradise like a key. It was the confession of the good thief that revealed the opening of paradise even to sinners. The good thief's confession made paradise accessible again by crying out as he departed from this life. That is taken from the matins of the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. The good thief's confession made paradise accessible once again by crying out as he departed this life. The cross is the key to paradise. It is the gateway to the city where we now pass from the old Jerusalem to the new Jerusalem. We are the new Jerusalem. And like the good thief, we too, even sinners, now have the right to eat the fruit of the tree of life. In the book of Revelation, it says, To the victor, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life that is in the garden of God. Now we eat the fruit of the tree of life, the Holy Eucharist, which protects us from spiritual death and corruption. In the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation, it says, Blessed are they who wash their robes in baptism so as to have the right to the tree of life and to enter the city through its gates. Where Adam, through disobedience, chose not to eat of the tree of life in favor of the other tree and therefore suffered corruption and death, We now have the right and the blessing to eat the fruit from the tree of life, which gives us spiritual sustenance and life. Now we're going to look at the Byzantine iconographic theology of the crucifix. There is a difference between uh, a Byzantine crucifix and a Western-style crucifix. Up until about the 12th century or so, iconography was the normative religious artistic expression. Uh, And then around that time, the 12th or 13th century, and that was in both the East and the West, around the 13th century, Spain adopted realism as the art form. And so the divergence now between Um, the two traditions with regards to the crucifix is that the Western crucifix, um, the intention of depicting Christ on a Western crucifix is to depict realism, 
right? And some, uh, some Western-style crucifixes are very graphic in some traditions, uh, some uh, very graphic and very realistic. Some of them will have a lot of blood. He'll have the cross of thorns, uh, a crown of thorns around his head. Um, and they are trying to capture the realism of the crucifixion and what he suffered on the cross. In Byzantine iconography, however, the intent in the depiction is theology rather than realism. And so in the Byzantine crucifix, we see Christ's body uh, is almost, it lo almost looks like it's in front of the cross. And it's, there's a very gentle curve to it. His body is flexed toward his right, and his head is bowed toward his mother. Uh, and his, um, his, his eyes are usually closed in, closed in death. There's one sentence in the central part of the divine liturgy, in the Eucharistic prayer, which I think opens to us and explains to us the theology of the Byzantine crucifix. In the Eucharistic prayer, the priest says, on the night he was betrayed, or rather, when he surrendered himself to death. That word rather makes a very important theologically nuanced shift in language. On the night he was betrayed, but rather, what that means is, let's say it another way, rather when he surrendered himself to death. And so that word rather is saying, let's be theologically clear and precise in how we describe Christ's witness as he was being crucified. The emphasis is not so much on the fact that he was betrayed or that he was the victim of crucifixion, but that he surrendered himself to death. He was always in control of his will. And that's why on the crucifix, there is a gentleness, there is a serenity, there is a peace to the way that he is depicted. He was always in control. He says, Jesus himself says this, this is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from the Father. And so in the iconography, even what is ugly and horrific, uh, such as the crucifixion, is transformed and it is transfigured and that's why we see that gentleness and serenity even in the midst of a horrific death. This is a very important theological nuance that highlights the difference between Christ being a victim versus being a victor. And this is why uh, we, uh, in the Byzantine tradition, uh, we venerate this particular type of cross. It's why we wear a cross around our neck that depicts the Byzantine iconographic theology of the crucifixion because this is the iconographic theology that we live and that we believe in and that we pray as Byzantine Catholics. And so this is the best um, depiction uh, of a crucifix for our particular uh, Byzantine expression. Very shortly, we will be singing the Paschal hymn, Christ is risen from the dead, by death he trampled death, and to those in the tombs he granted life. St. Mary Magdalene, St. Mary of Egypt, and St. Helena all made a pilgrimage to the cross and the tomb, and they all bore witness to the resurrected life in Christ. 
So I share all this to somehow help us understand what it means to make a pilgrimage to the cross, the tomb, and then to enter into the resurrected life of Christ. Um, and I mention this also to highlight the double insight that we're given when we repent. And we're given at one and the same time, not the hope of being reconciled with God, but the assurance of being reconciled with God because the Holy Spirit is the one who initiates repentance. The Holy Spirit gives the grace. We can't even repent without grace. <laughs> he gives us the grace. Now it's up to us to respond, to have the will to say yes. And when we do, the fullness of time occurs and we find ourselves reconciled back to our father's house like the prodigal son, and then we can truly share in the joy of the resurrection as we move from the fast to the feast. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory.